going to look at the breathing system. Um, so a quick summary of breathing, in comes the good air, out goes the bad. Um, for your leading search, you are going to need to know a little bit more depth, I suppose, than junior search in terms of the role of the cilia in the breathing system, also the actual mechanism of inhalation and exhalation and the role the brain has to play in that. Apart from that, there isn't that much new stuff in this chapter. So let's start by having a look at the structure of the breathing system. Um, so this diagram, I recommend you draw the diagram that's in your book, by the way, rather than this one into the notes. Um, but this one shows, uh, similar to your book, uh, trachea coming down here in the middle of the diagram. And that is breaking into your bronchi. Uh, and each bronchus then further divides into bronchioles. They're the thinner tubes. And at the end of the bronchioles, you have your alveoli. And that's the actual site of gaseous exchange exchange where the gas is um, exchanged with the blood. Um, now what else? All of this takes place within what's called the thoracic cavity and the thoracic cavity is framed by the ribs on the outside and there is some muscle involvement as well and the two different types of muscle that you'll need to know about will be the diaphragm down here at the bottom which is a little sheet of muscle down here at the bottom of the thoracic cavity or the thorax as you sometimes hear it called and then in between each pair of ribs there are muscles called intercostal muscles. Now finally the slight um, addition to this diagram would be the involvement of your cilia here. Um, so on the upper passages so in your nasal cavity and down the back of your throat and into your trachea um, we have some mucus producing cells and those mucus producing cells produce a mucus that traps any dirt that's trying to get down into the lungs and there are little tiny hairs called cilia along those passages as well and the cilia help to waft back up any dust that gets trapped in the mucus and then of course it goes across your epiglottis up here and down into your esophagus and down into your stomach where the acid gets rid of it. Right, so to move on then to have a look at the muscles and how they are involved in breathing. So as I mentioned, there are two different muscles that we need to think about here. But first of all, let's look at the whole chest cavity here. As I said, that's called the thorax. And um, it is defined by the ribs on the outside. And then the muscles that are involved in breathing are the diaphragm shown down here at the bottom and the intercostal muscles, which are located just here in between the ribs. So just there, 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 you'll find all your little intercostal muscles. Over here on the other side, we have a side view. And again, you can see the ribs from the side and you can see the lungs inside in them. And you notice the diaphragm is going right up here. It's quite dome shaped would be the description of the diaphragm. OK, so what happens then when we inhale? Um, so when we inhale, the um, diaphragm and the intercostal muscles are both involved in contracting. So when the, inter the intercostal muscles contract, they force the rib cage to go up and out and then when the diaphragm contracts it moves downwards and all of those changes bring about a change in air pressure that we'll be looking at in a little bit more detail later and that is what causes us to draw in air into our thoracic cavity. So next thing we're going to look at there is the difference between inhaled and exhaled air. Now this isn't hugely important um, for leaving cert, you're unlikely to get any questions on the exact percentages. I've not seen that before. However, you do need to know that the um, oxygen percentage, as you might guess, is higher in the inhaled air. And of course, that oxygen is going into the bloodstream. So by the time you get to your exhaled air, it is has a lower percentage of oxygen. 
whereas the carbon dioxide in the inhaled air is quite low in comparison to the carbon dioxide in the exhaled air, which is up there at 4%. Uh, nitrogen is unchanged because we don't really do anything with the nitrogen. And while there isn't that much water vapour in the air that we breathe in, um, that air is moistened as it goes into our lungs uh, in order to help with diffusing into the bloodstream. And when the air comes back out, it is quite moist. So there's quite a lot of water vapour on in that air. Right, so let's have a look now at the actual mechanism of gaseous exchange. So what's happening at the alveoli? Um, so here we have a picture of an alveolus and um, the air is coming in here at the top through your bronchiole going down into the alveoli. Uh, this alveolus here then is the site of exchange of gases with the blood. Um, so importantly, the oxygen here goes into the bloodstream. This here is our capillary going along the side of the alveolus. And that capillary is carrying the blood from left over to the right here. So oxygen diffuses from the alveoli into the bloodstream and carbon dioxide diffuses from the bloodstream out to the alveolus and then up and out of the uh, bronchiole and out of the lungs. Um, now, why does that happen? Oh, sorry, just to look at the, just a little summary of that again. So the air comes into the alveoli from the bronchioles Oxygen diffuses into those alveoli and goes from there into the capillary. And once it's in the capillary, it goes up in the blood towards the heart. And then what's happening in the opposite direction? Um, from the heart vessels, you have um, blood coming down into your lungs again. And that blood is full of carbon dioxide. So when it gets to the lungs, the carbon dioxide that's in the blood diffuses from the little blood capillaries out into the alveolus. From the alveolus it goes into the bronchi, uh, bronchioles first and then into the bronchi and then onto the trachea and then all the way up through the um, voice box and out through the nose and mouth. Um, so what exactly is happening at the alveoli and how are they um, adapted for it. So the main process that's happening at the alveoli is diffusion. I've already mentioned it a couple of times and we remember this from our chapter on diffusion. Um, it is the movement of a substance from an area where it is in high concentration to an area where it is in low concentration and that is the basic process that's happening at your alveoli. Um, now how are they adapted for this? Well, the alveoli have loads of capillaries around them, um, so they have a very good blood supply. There are loads of alveoli, which increases the surface area, and the alveoli and the blood capillaries are sharing a common cell membrane. So it's a very um, thin surface that these gases have to diffuse across the alveolus. Another way of saying that is the alveolus is only one cell thick. Um, so those are your adaptations of the alveoli. Also, the air gets moistened as it goes down, which helps with diffusion. Now, what causes speech then? Um, this has never been asked before, but just for your own interest. Um, the air passes over the little folds in our voice box and it causes those little folds to start vibrating. And then muscles pull on the cartilage that's at the side of those folds to change the pitch of the voice or if you're talking about changing the sound of the voice itself that would be as a result of the lips and the tongue changing their um, shape and orientation to each other. Um, now getting on to the slightly higher level stuff let's look at the mechanism of breathing. So it, the basic principle of breathing is that gases move from high pressure to low pressure um, in order to try to equalize the pressure. So how does that relate to inhalation or breathing in? Um, so when we are breathing in, 
your diaphragm contracts. So if we look at our little diagram of our thoracic cavity here, when the diaphragm contracts, it moves downwards. You remember its shape was up like this as a dome, but it actually moves downwards. You can see that that's increasing the space inside in your chest cavity. Now the intercostal muscles also contract and when they contract, they cause the ribs to move up and outwards. So as those ribs move up and outwards, the overall change is that your chest capacity now or your thorax, the amount of space in your thorax is much bigger than it was. Um, if you have more space in there, if you have a higher volume in there, that will cause the pressure inside there to drop. And that lower air pressure causes the air to move in from the outside into your lungs. Um, what then happens when you exhale? Um, now exhalation involves the muscles relaxing, so it's called a passive process. Passive meaning you're not using energy, the muscles are actually relaxing rather than contracting. Um, so what is going to happen then when your alveoli, or sorry, excuse me, when your diaphragm and your lungs relax? So when the diaphragm relaxes, remember it was down here, when the diaphragm relaxes, it goes upwards um, back into its normal arch shape. When the intercostal muscles along here between our ribs relax, the ribs go downwards and inwards, so down and in, um, which has the overall effect of decreasing the amount of space that you have inside in your chest cavity. Um, so if you decrease the amount of space or the volume of the chest ca uh, cavity, you are increasing the air pressure. And if you increase the air pressure, that shoves the air effectively out of the lungs. Now, um, how is the brain involved in all of this? Um, well, the brain actually sets the rhythm of breathing um, in an unconscious way. Um, how does it do that? Well, there's a region of the brain called the medulla oblongata, which is monitoring the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood that flows through it. Now, over a short period of time, we can actually control our breathing. For example, if we're singing or if we're doing an important reading and we need a little bit of extra air, we can take a deep breath and then we can control the release of that breath. But you can't do that forever because your brain actually just won't let you do that. Um, if you tried to stop breathing, if you held your breath, the carbon dioxide levels in your blood would rise and that gets um, picked up by the medulla oblongata in your brain and it sends out a signal to make you breathe really quickly or to gasp for breath. Um, now, a question that comes up fairly often is about the adaptations of the lungs for gas exchange. And I mentioned some of these earlier, but just to give you a list of them, um, they have a large surface area um, a huge surface area of alveoli up to 90 meters squared and um, there's a short distance between the air and the blood here um, that is because they share a common membrane if you remember the alveoli and the capillary share a common membrane um, and then the walls of the alveoli are quite elastic as well um, and there are lots of um, capillaries around them which is another adaptation for exchange. Um, sometimes it has come up as well how um, if an adaptation of the air and the air itself tends to be moistened and warmed, particularly when it passes through the nose. So if ever you've done exercise and you're told to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth, the reason is that if the air passes in through your nose, it gets warmed and moistened more than if it passes through your mouth. And warm, moist air will diffuse a lot easier into your bloodstream than colder air. Um, now, the next sl slide is about transport of oxygen in the blood. And that's just going back over what we already know. It's in the red blood cells. Um, and it is bound there to form 
uh, bound there to the haemoglobin in the red blood cells. Uh, don't be worrying about the extra 3%. And the next slide might be slightly confusing there, so don't worry too much about it. Um, the carbon dioxide, as far as you're concerned, is transported in the blood plasma. Um, now, what we will need to know, though, are a few conditions um, that might affect your breathing system. And here's a list. So we've bronchitis, we've emphysema, asthma, uh, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, flaps lung, TB or pneumonia. Um, now you need to know details on one of those and the easiest one by far is your asthma. Um, so the symptoms of asthma would be coughing or wheezing, um, not being able to get your breath, breathlessness, um, maybe tightness in the chest. Um, you will need to know the causes and it's caused by the narrowing of the airways and the airways or the tubes that are in your lung are narrowed because they become inflamed and what causes the inflammation would be um, immune response and inappropriate immune response to uh, the presence of things called allergens and those allergens might be pollen um, animal dander which means basically the hair and the fur on animals maybe smoke or dust mites and some chemicals um, uh, even exercise you'll see the misspelling there um, so all of those things could be potential allergens and allergens are particles or changes in the environment that cause this inflammatory response in an asthmatic um, airway. Now prevention and treatment, um, well prevention would be to identify what your allergens are or your triggers for your asthma attacks and just avoid them and then the treatment would be to use bronchiodilators um, and they're usually administered as inhalers and have a steroid element in them that helps to open up those tiny bronchioles. Um, and then another disease that you could look at might be emphysema um, but uh, as I said before you really only need to know details on one and asthma is probably the easiest of those. Um, so that is the end of the breathing system and we'll stop our recording there.